So oftentimes when I'm painting, I get to a point in the work, um, and, and I don't know, some artists may not wish to admit this, but where I'm sure that everything is lost. Somehow in, in, in the image that was in my head got muddied when it came out on the canvas, and I feel like I'm almost trapped by the brushwork that I've already put on, 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 onto, the, onto the page or onto the canvas. So one of my teachers many years ago, as I was standing in um, the middle of the French countryside crying because, literally, because the painting was not working, he, um, he taught me that this kind of constriction could be transformed into an open landscape through a leap of faith and a redoubling of my expressive efforts to leave a mark. So when I read the text of The Crossing and the Song of the Sea, um, I was really drawn to how the Israelites marked their deliverance from slavery and the Egyptian army by offering song and dance to God. So this is what I focused on, and this is what this work is going to focus on. The text tells us that Moses and the Israelites sang first, followed by Miriam and the women. And the verbs used to describe their singing are different. For Moses, the text says, as yeshir Moshe uvne Israel, then sang Moses and the children of Israel, and then the song. And for Miriam, the text says, V'ta'an lehem Miriam, shiru l'adonai. Miriam chanted to them, as Fox translates, um, Sing to, to Adonai, for he has triumphed. Yes, triumphed the horse and its charioteer he flung into the sea. So in my shut reading, which became this artwork, I wanted to focus on two main questions. The first was, what was the nature of Miriam's singing, and how might it have differed from Moses's? And then second, the text connects the moment that Miriam led the women in song and dance with the revealing of her role as prophetess. And I was very intrigued by this, and I wanted to understand more how the description of Miriam for the first time as prophetess might inform our understanding of the verb vita'an, which is used to describe her singing or chanting. And my intuition suggested that the ta'an was more um, of what the verb, that the meaning of the verb was more like a call and response. And I wanted to look into the text to see if I could find some proof to back up my intuition. So I first I, was, I, I looked at what the, how the text described what Miriam and the woman were doing. So it says that Miriam... The, and Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam sang the ta'an unto them. So it says the women went out after her. So already in the text, to me, I see that there's like a choreography, a back and forth, an answer or a reply in the form of action. And this choreography creates an environment of dialogue what, you know, if you're a musician, you might call, antiphonal call uh, an antiphonal chant of call and response. But for me, as a visual artist, I'm seeing sort of like this, inter this, this a beginning of some sort of relationship, of some sort of relationship of forms of moving back and forth. So then I look to other places in the text where they, the, you, they use the verb vita'an. So in an, there's a, a number of cases where the verb is used, and a lot of them uh, include dancing uh, and singing. One of them is when the, the, the people dance around the golden calf. Um, and often it refers to a response of singing and dancing after they've overcome sort of some sort of danger or a ret after they've returned to God or, or a God in the, t in the circumstances of the golden calf after a loss of faith, sometimes due to hardship and war, sometimes... Or, and sometimes even with a direct reference to the crossing of the sea and the, and the Exodus narrative. There was one t um, use, however, which really resonated with me, and that was in Hosea, where, um, the, where, where the verb vata'an is used directly to indicate a reply. And I saw it as creating a ripple a effect or a chain of cause and effect as one entity after another responded in reaction to external stimuli. So the text says, and it shall come to pass that day, I will respond, said the Lord, I will respond, a'aneh, which is the same verb as vata'an, to the heavens, and they shall respond, ta'aneh, to the earth, and the earth shall respond, ta'aneh, to the corn. So collectively, these, use, these uses of, of ta'an suggested to me 
an embodied response, a reply both in voice and in movement at a climactic moment that contains the residue of relief, gratitude, and symbiosis. So going back to my original question about the, the nature of the difference between Moses and Miriam singing, um, if ta'an means to respond in an, embodied, in an embodied way, then what was Miriam responding to? So was she responding, as the text might indicate, because of the, um, like the linear um, version of it, that she was responding to Moses' song, because Moses' song comes first, and then Miriam's comes after, which was one of the things that kind of irked me about the text, so I was thinking about that. Or was she responding directly to God? Um, was she responding to the, this miraculous deliverance from, from slavery and from the Egyptian army? Or was she responding to a need in the people that she recognized, that a need of, of having come through something that's threatening and stressful, and like this need to sort of burn off or shake off the residue of fear and embrace the miracle of survival? Whatever way you want to understand it, in each case, for me, visually, it created this pattern or this, these two distinct forms of call and response. So if you think of this pattern in terms of form, you could imagine that there would be two separate forms, let's say two parallel lines. So if we look at this first slide, you'll see the call and the response. Miriam was seeing her, the verb is vita'an, which, is to, which I'm, I'm understanding as chanting in response. So there was some call to which she was responding to. And this, these, are, this, these creates these two forms. And they create positive space. Yet by their very existence, in between them, they create another space, which is a neg which, which like in visual terms we would call negative space. So can we see the next slide? Thanks. So here we have the call and the response is the positive space and the negative space, this emptiness, which I, I, I describe using um, like the Hebrew term ayin, which sometimes re replies to the nothingness of the space of the divine. And you'll, you'll see why I'm, get, I'm going there in a minute. So if you think about, um, okay, so similarly, the call to which Miriam is responding and her reply create two positive forms. And in the space between them um, is the space of ayin. And what I'm suggesting is that, by, is that through this pattern that she's setting up, she's creating a, this negative space of ayin, which is really an opportunity for sacred space, for God or for the Shekhinah, however you understand it, to enter and emerge into the um, presence of the people. Okay, so we also know that Miriam commanded the women to sing after her. So like the passage in Hosea, which I was talking about before, she creates this chain or this echo of, call, of, of repeated um, responses to her reply. Um, and she creates, and in doing so, not only does she create this ayin, this sacred space for God to enter, but she also creates the opportunity for a relationship between the, um, the, group, the, the person who's doing the, the initial replying, which is her, Miriam, and the other people who are responding to her. And if you imagine, as we chant today, that this would go on and on, um, that there would be this ongoing uh, emergence of a relationship between these two forms. So the second question that I was interested in is why are we introducing, why is the text introducing Miriam as a prophetess now? So again, I return to this idea of the pattern of forms created by Miriam's calling out and um, look to the text to see where else this pattern would occur, occur, would occur and what, if anything, the text could illuminate for me about that pattern. So if we go back a little bit in the narrative, um, we reach the event what, that the song is, is commemorating, it's the crossing of the sea. So if we recall how, it was part, how the sea was parted, we know that, that um, as we talked about before, there, there was the, the hand and the rod and the sea was parted to two sides so that the children of Israel could come through in the midst of the sea on dry land. So again, in the text, I saw this pattern of creating two forms, of the forms of the waves of the water as they parted 
um, being the positive forms, and then the space in between, the dry land where they walked, as being the negative space. Okay, and in and and this space was was um, a space that was made safe for them by God. It was a path of deliverance and a path forward. And if we go even further back in the text a little bit, to um, we we see um, we read about um, how. Um, before they were crossing the sea, they were encamped. The Egyptians were there, and the Israel camps were there. Was camp was there, and we read that the messenger of God was going before the camp of Israel. That was going before the camp of Israel moved on and went behind them, and the cloud, the column of cloud, moved ahead of them and stood behind them, coming between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. So again, in the text. I see that there's this relationship between two forms. There's the camp of Israel and the camp of Egypt, and then there's something in between. And that something in between, again, is the cloud of God. And this is, the, again, the negative space that I'm, that, that I'm seeing as a visual artist, which is this space of Ayin. And again, the, this cloud is creating a barrier, or, or a, a, in this case, a, a space of sacredness, but also a space of safety, because it's protecting them from each other. So, as I said, Miriam's response and her command to the women to sing create this pattern, uh, again, of calling and responding, creating two distinct sounds with a space of silence in between. Because when we sing and call in response, or when we respond, even when we talk to somebody in dialogue, there's a, there's a, there's a moment in between the singing where there's silence, or the reverberations of the, the sound waves. But there's th that moment, okay? And so by singing out in this way, Miriam creates uh, a space for the indwelling presence of God to reside, a moment of silence that's a path of deliverance to the divine and a path forward. And by calling Miriam a prophet at this moment, just prior to her leading this response and song, the text may be indicating her ability to create the sacred space, a space that is transformational and that offers a path forward. For what is prophecy but a divinely inspired revelation? a foretelling of what is to come, and in the language of cause and effect, a response to something that has yet to occur. So for the reader today, the introduction of Miriam's prophetess and her engagement in this pattern of reply and response also forces us to consider how we would respond to hardship and deliverance in the future. What is our response to being offered the opportunity to leave a negative situation for a new beginning? And how can we see that space that we create between others and ourselves, and between the environment and ourselves, and between one event in our lives and another, as a moment of sacred space or silence or pause, a moment of deliverance or transformation, a moment to breathe in the power and the protection of the divine? So reading the text in forms, by literally interpreting the structure of the text, um, I set out, um, I, I, I allowed this, this reading to so inform the process of how I was going to work in, this, in, in the painting. So um, Dr. Prosser spoke earlier about the Peshat um, hinging on methodology. And in, in this case, my work really does emerge from, um, the pr from this process um, and the the, this understanding of the structure of the text. Um, my covenant on creating the piece was to, was to express this climatic moment of Miriam's response and the pattern of call and response that it inspired. And I really was, I really was struck by, in the text, about how, like, you know, they're celebrating and they're singing this song, but it's come after, like, a wave of destruction, literally. And um, so I really, felt like it couldn't be like that this song was not like a lullaby, okay? It, it, it had to capture the, gra the song, the painting that I was going to create had to capture the gravitas and the complexity of, of the emotional and psychological context and the text itself. So I felt strongly that the, 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 ta the canvas could not start from a place of triumph. It couldn't start from a place of just being blank. Instead, it had to emerge, it had to rise up, va'ale min ha'aretz, like Miriam's song and recalling the, Pharaoh, the, um, the fear of Pharaoh that the Israelites might indeed rise up and overcome their adversity. So it, it had to undergo a process of trial so that the artwork itself could engage with the text. 
So how did I do this? Well, first I started by stretching the canvas. A lot of, um, sometimes artists stretch their own canvas, sometimes they don't, and it comes pre-stretched. But for me, it was very important as part of the process to stretch it. So I took this canvas that was just this very fluid piece of material, and I forced it to conform to a rigid structure that already existed. Then, instead of using a primed canvas, when a priming is like a white or protective layer that's applied to the surface of the canvas so that it will prepare the surface for the paint, okay? And preparing the surface for the paint. So instead of using that, I decided to use unprimed or raw canvas because I wanted to expose the canvas directly to the paint and to the force of the application of my brushwork. So then I wanted to try and ex have the canvas experience the burden of slavery and oppression. Well, how, how was I going to do that? So if you go to the next slide. So what I did was I started with this raw blank canvas and I wrote the, this word anato. Am I saying it correctly? Okay, from um, Exodus 1.11, which means to afflict or to oppress. And it's a word that's used multiple times while they're sli the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. Um, and in this case, when Pharaoh set the taskmasters, o taskmasters over the slaves. And so I used it as a, as a, because I wanted to incorporate the text literally and also because I wanted to get this sense of oppression. Okay. So then I went through a process, if you can just go through the next through, through um, few slides, of rubbing the text into the canvas. And in so doing, erasing it from our eyes, but incorporating it and um, absorbing it into the fabric of the text itself, in the same way that this pro that that the period of being en enslaved was indelibly marked onto the souls of the Israelites. So once I felt that the canvas had absorbed enough uh, pain, <laughs> I began the process of liberation. So what I started with was the the, the water from the sea. And um, I wanted to get, again, I wanted to go back to these forms of the two positive forms. So I started by pouring this, uh, a mixture of water and paint down the two sides of the canvas. And you can see that there. And I did it over and over again until it left this dry land or this, peri this, this area of negative space in between. From there, I started laying on colors, areas of color. And the, the, the different areas reflect these different recalls and responses, okay? So at the bottom we have this space here with that sort of outlined in black. And to me that represents the, um, the song of Moses and the children of Israel, which was essentially one group of people as one voice singing one thing. And that's why it's sort of enclosed. And then um, you see the, um, this is this sound wave or this form here. Um, of color is the call to which Miriam responded. And this layer, the crimson layer, is Miriam's initial reply, the ta'an. And the reason why I used the color red or crimson is because visually red moves forward. It, 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 it speaks, it comes out to us as opposed to receding to the eye, okay? And Miriam, and, I'm, and, and I was concerned with this relationship between Miriam and being a prophetess, and prophecy being something that you see forward, I thought it was an appropriate color. So as you see in between the forms, there are these areas of um, rest or repose, which signify the, the, the negative space or the opportunity for um, the divine to enter. And this last form here in, is, is the response of the women as they, as they went out and they had this embodied um, relationship and this embodied movement of working um, with the musical instruments and of dancing. And part of the gestural brushwork that you see here and, and the flicking of the paint is intended to give you the sense of this movement. So I, I, I want to give you guys a chance to ask um, some questions. I just want to finish up with two things. Um, I forgot to mention, of course, that um, as I was going back in the text and looking at the, the cloud and how it moved forward and backward, it also created that, 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 that um, pattern of two positive spaces and a negative one. And but earlier, um, Peter mentioned about how um, the process of visual art 
Um, and I think uh, Dr. Prowser also talked about this, about the two types of God, one that's very structured and one that's more, that comes uh, as things, that adapts as things go along. So I want you, I don't want you to be under the misconception that I, this artwork was completely pre-planned because it wasn't. There were certainly many uh, uh, aspects of it that were thought out in advance and there was certainly a structure, but there was also something about the process itself that, um, from which the artwork emerges. And so I, 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 I was not, I, I could not see the, um, my shot, my visual shot until it was shown to me on the canvas. So one of the things that emerged from that process is the cloud uh, of God moving back and forth um, in these two forms that I hadn't necessarily um, planned on, but that came out in the process of painting. So I hope that gave you a, a sense of where I, of what I was struggling with in the text and how I um, tried to create to bring that into fruition in terms of color and form. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, so to go to, to answer Peter's question, the difference between this and my other paintings. So I'm a very intuitive painter um, and very process oriented. So I'm very interested in what comes out during the process of painting. So Many, and I'm very informed and motivated by color. So many times uh, my paintings begin with a color impression. Um, like Turner often worked in this way, but in a much more literal way. But I will, I'll begin with a color impression and I'll see what comes out of it, okay? And the process, and, the, and the, it's almost like the painting is directing me. A, f a number of years ago as I started to work on more Jewish themes, I, and I began incorporating my study with my art, I had to adapt my process because I was trying to convey something specific. I had a specific intention or kavana and a specific theme. So the answer is, is that, that um, I work in both ways. And uh, I have done a number of pieces that are more uh, conceptual and that also are more, that reference more uh, a, um, you know, a specific Jewish text or a specific Jewish idea. However, and this takes me to my second, the second question, which is beautiful, um, how, which is how, how important is, to me, is it to me that the viewer would understand the context with which I came to the canvas? It is, it is my intention that, the, that these paintings and that, that I create and the artworks that I create stand on their own. So as, as a visual aesthetic piece of work. So for me, for somebody to come to this piece and appreciate the form, appreciate the color, and to read something into it and to receive a message from it that has nothing to do with what I intended is absolutely perfect. And that, 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 that's thrilling. Now, it's also a different level of appreciation for them to perhaps have, um, for, it to, for, for, it, for them to understand the, the Jewish or the context lying underneath it. And I have a piece that, that I've done that's very abstract like this one that's about the process of creation that's in a chapel, okay? And so when people are there, they're gonna be inclined to make those connections. But it, it doesn't, but the pieces are intended to be much more universal than that. And so I, I don't, it, it doesn't, it, it just, it, it intrigues me both ways. And um, I, I, I'm a firm believer that the artwork uh, has um, the image itself once it's created is um, a messenger and has a message to reveal to each person and that message is different. And I honor that and um, I believe that the, that the viewer that comes to the piece is an integral part of completing the artwork. So whatever, uh, just like there may, like uh, we spoke earlier about, there may be m many shots, there may be many uh, shots of this painting by many viewers and they're all valid. Oh, it's called response. 
So the last question was, did I return to the text in the process of painting? Um, so no. OK, no. I didn't return to the text. Um, I felt like I had spent quite a bit of time reading and thinking about the text, and that I had integrated what I wanted to take from the text. Um, so I didn't go back and reread the text as I was working. However, the answer is also yes. I did go back to the text because I went back to find the word anato. I started um, stretching. I started working. And then I, even though I knew I was taking a word, I, I hadn't selected the word yet. So I did go back and look um, earlier in the narrative and find that specific word. So I had my at time there. And I, did, and I did pick that word out and, and use it. It was one of the questions, as you, when you look at the text, the song is written in a specific way, like a, like a poem. And, uh, I, and it also, um, it does have these silences or these spaces in between the words, but it's also indented. And so in, it, it in itself, and I was aware of this as I was doing this, is the negative space in my diagram, in the way that I was seeing things. And or you could think of it as the positive space with the negative space, the inversion of what I was originally talking about. And so these bars of, of response and response and response of symbiosis are the, um, could be um, compared to the way that the text is written, um, uh, the song is written in, in, in the text. And the water on the sides, the, uh, the I, however you see it as negative or positive, but the blank space on either side of the, of the way that the text is written. So yes, I was aware of that structure, and it did, it seemed to me quite, um, you know, one of those miraculous coincidences that it was also part of the same, the same form. And after I did it, I, I came to the painting later and also saw something else as well, like that I hadn't in, in consciously intended, but that this is almost like rungs of a ladder. And, and my, whole, um, my whole intention was to, create, was to convey Miriam's ability to create this space of elevation. And so the fact that this turned out to look like a ladder ascending to, some, I mean, I just, so, but it was totally subconscious. So, so that's what I'm saying. There's lots of different shot ways of looking at the, at the painting and they're all, they're all beautiful. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.